I'm going to read from a book called Mass Media and Mass Man, compiled by Alan Casty. And it is a series of different chapters from other books. This is an excerpt from Of Happiness and Despair We Have No Measure by Ernest Vanden Hogg, which is in his book The Fabric of Society, published in 1957. <clears throat> All media, mass media, in the end alienate people from personal experience and though appearing to offset it, intensify their moral isolation from each other, from reality, and from themselves. One may turn to the mass media when lonely or bored, but mass media, once they become a habit, impair the capacity for meaningful experience. Though more diffuse and not as gripping, the habit feeds on itself, establishing a vicious circle as addictions do. The mass media do not physically replace individual activities and contacts, excursions, travel, parties, etc., but they impinge on all. The portable radio is taken everywhere from seashore to mountaintop, and everywhere it isolates the bearer of and from his surroundings, from other people, and from himself. Most people escape by being themselves at any time by voluntarily tuning in on something or somebody. Anyway, it is nearly beyond the power of individuals to escape broadcasts. Music and public announcements are piped into restaurants, bars, shops, cafes, and lobbies, into public means of transportation and even taxis. You can turn off your radio, but not your neighbors, nor can you silence his portable or the set at the restaurant. Fortunately, most persons do not seem to miss privacy, the cost of which is even more beyond the average income than the cost of individuality. People are never quite in one place or group without at the same time, singly or collectively gravitating somewhere else, abstracted, if not transported by the mass media. The incessant announcements, arpeggios, crooning, sobs, bellows, brains, and jingles draw to some faraway world at large, and by weakening community with immediate surroundings, make people lonely when in a crowd and crowded when alone. We have already stressed that mass media must offer homogenized fare to meet an average of tastes. Further, whatever the quality of offerings, the very fact that one after the other is absorbed continuously, indiscriminately, and casually trivi trivializes all. Even the most profound of experiences, articulated too often on the same level, is reduced to a cliche. The impact of each of the offerings of mass media is thus weakened by the next one. But the impact of the stream of all mass media offerings is cumulative and strong. It lessens people's capacity to experience life itself. Sometimes it is argued that the audience confuses actuality with mass media fiction and reacts to the characters and situations that appear in soap operas or comic strips as though they were real. For instance, Wedding presents are sent to fictional couples. It seems more likely, however, that the audience prefers to invest fiction with reality, as a person might prefer to dream without actually confusing it with reality. After all, even the kids know that Hopalong Cassidy is an actor, and the adults know that I Love Lucy is fiction. Both, however, may attempt to live the fiction because they prefer it to their own lives. The significant effect is not the quite limited investment of fiction with reality, but the derealization of life lived in largely fictitious terms. Art can deepen the perception of reality, but popular culture veils it, diverts it, and becomes an obstacle to experience in it. It is not so much an escape from life, but an invasion of life first, and ultimately evasion altogether. I have to just break with what he says here about art, because um, art can be uh, art can be uh, used to dictate what culture is as well. So. 
he's trying to say art can deepen perception of reality, but um, at the same time, whatever your perception of art is um, dictated by the popular culture, then you're going to be controlled in that manner as well. So parents well knowing that mass media can absorb energy often lighten the strain that attempts of their children to reach for activity and direct experience would impose. They allow some energy to be absorbed by the vicarious experience of the television screen. Before television, the cradle was rocked or poppy juice given to inhibit the initiative and motility of small children. Television, unlike these physical sedatives, tranquilizes by means of a substitute gratification. Manufactured activities and plots are offered to still the child's hunger for experiencing life. They effectively neutralize initiative and channel imagination. But the early introduction of de-individualized characters and situations and early homogenization of tastes on a diet of meaningless activity hardly foster development. Perhaps poppy juice offering no models in which to cast the imagination was better. The homogenizing effect of comic books or television, the fact that they neither express nor appeal to individuality, seems far more injurious to the child's mind and character than the violence they feature, though it is the latter that is often blamed for juvenile delinquency. The blame is misplaced. <clears throat> Excuse me. Violence is not new to life or fiction. It waxed large in ancient fables, fairy tales, and in tragedies from Sophocles to Shakespeare. Mom always knew that her boy could not have thought of it, that the other boys must have seduced him. The belief that viewing or reading about violence persuades children to engage in it is mom's ancient conviction disguised as psychiatry. Children are quite spontaneously bloodthirsty and need both direct and fantasy outlets for violence. What is wrong with the violence of the mass media is not that it is violence, but that it is not art, that it is meaningless violence, which thrills but does not gratify. The violence of the desire for life and meaning is displaced and appears as a desire for meaningless violence. But the violence which cease, ceaselessly supplied cannot ultimately gratify it because it does not meet the repressed desire. The gist of any culture is an ethos which gives meaning to the lives of those who dwell in it. If this be the purport of popular culture, it is foiled. We have suggested how it comes to grief in various aspects. What makes popular culture as a whole so disconcerting is best set, set, forth, is best set forth now by exploring the relationship among diversion, art, and boredom. The yearning for diversion to which popular culture caters cannot be satiated by diversion whereof a little more than a little is by much too much because no displaced craving can be satisfied by catering to it in its displaced form. Only when it becomes possible to experience the desire in its true form and to dispense with the internalized processes that balked and displaced, it does actual gratification become possible. Diversion at most through weariness and fatigue can numb and distract anxiety. For instance, in many popular movies, the tear ducts are massaged and thrills are produced by mechanized assaults on the centers of sensation. We are diverted temporarily and in the end perhaps drained, but not gratified. Mm -hmm. Direct manipulation of sensations can produce increases and discharges of tension, as does masturbation, but it is a substitute. It does not involve the whole individual as an individual. It does not involve reality, but counterfeits it. Sensations directly stimulated and discharged without being intensified and completed through feelings sifted, acknowledged by the intellect, are debasing because they do not involve the whole individual in his relation to reality. When one becomes inured to bypassing reality and individuality in favor of meaningless excitement, ultimate gratif gratification becomes possible. Once fundamental impulses are thwarted beyond retrieving, once they are so deeply repressed that no awareness is left of their aims, once the desire for a meaningful life has been lost as well as the capacity to create it, only a void remains. Life fades into tedium 
when the barrier between impulses and aims is so high that neither penetrates into consciousness and no sublimination whatever takes place. Diversion, however frantic, can overwhelm temporarily, but not ultimate, not ultimately relieve the boredom which oozes from non-fulfillment. Though the bored person hungers for things to happen to him, the disheartening fact is that when they do, he empties them of the very meaning he unconsciously yearns for by using them as distractions. In popular culture, even the second coming would be just another barren thrill to be watched on television till Milton Berle comes on. No distraction can cure boredom, just as the company so unceasingly pursued cannot stave off loneliness. The bored person is lonely for himself, not as he thinks for others. He misses the individuality, the capacity for experience from which he is debarred. No distraction can restore it. Hence he goes unrelieved and insatiable. The popular demand for inside stories for vicarious sharing of the private lives of personalities rests on the craving for private life, even someone else's. Of those who are dimly aware of having none what whatever, or at least no life that holds their interest. The attempts to allay boredom are as assiduous as they are unveiling. Countless books pretend to teach by general rules and devices what cannot be learned by devices and rules. Individual personalities cannot be mass produced with happiness thrown in or your money back. Nevertheless, the message of much popular culture is you too can be happy. If you can only buy this car or that hair tonic, you will be thrilled. You will have adventure, romance, popularity. You will no longer be lonely and left out if you follow this formula. As success, happiness, or at least freedom from anxiety is also the burden of popular religion. As unchristian in these, its aims, as it is in its means. From Dale Carnegie to Norman Vincent Peale to Harry and Bonaro Overstreet, only the vocabulary changes. The principle remains the same. The formula is well illustrated in the following. Warm smile is an attribute of charm. For this, train the upper lip by this method. Stretch the upper lip down over the teeth and say moo. Hold the lip between the teeth and smile. Purse the lips, pull them downward and grin. Let the lower jaw fall and try to touch your nose with your upper lip. Months of daily practice are necessary to eliminate strain from the new way of smiling. But it too can become as natural as all beguiling smiles must be. Whatever the formula, nothing can be more tiresome than the tireless, cheerless pursuit of pleasure. Days go slowly when they are empty. One cannot tell one from the other, and yet the years go fast. When time is endlessly killed, one lives in an endless present until time ends without ever having passed, leaving a person who never lived to exclaim, I wasted time, and now doth time waste me.